The majority of the American people, even the recent polling, shows that 60 percent of the American people are unhappy uh, with their choices. If you take the total number of Americans and the percentage that, uh, that register, and then the percentage that vote, and then the percentage that vote for a candidate, um, you end up electing a president with 30, 32 percent of the American people. And because they have been more or less conditioned to believe, well, the two candidates are different and we have to vote for the lesser of two evils, they end up voting, half the people who vote for the president are voting for the lesser of two evils. And, uh, and so therefore, 16 percent of the American people essentially are saying, hey, I like this candidate, and, and they, they vote for the president. You know, yesterday, I had a phone call, the first phone call that I personally received or uh, had, had, had received from anybody in the McCain uh, uh, candidacy, in, in his campaign. They called, and um, it was a bit of a surprise to me because <laughs> their request was that I endorse John McCain today. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I don't like the idea of getting about two or three million people angry at me. So, uh, but, but they're, they were serious, and it was a respectful call, and the argument was he would do a little less harm than the other candidate. And, you know, we, we just don't need uh, to do that anymore. You know, in 19, I believe it was 1988, and I believe Ralph Nader will remember this campaign, uh, there was a debate going on with uh, George Bush Sr. and Dukakis, and it was to be put on by the League of Women Voters. And uh, they, there was a secret agreement between George Bush Sr. and Dukakis that they would dictate all the terms, that they would say who can come and who the moderator is and all this, and who had to be excluded. And uh, they, uh, the, when they presented these details to League of Women Voters, they said, no way, they won't do it. And this was their statement. Um, the demands of the two campaigns would perpetuate a fraud on the American voter. That's where we are. And then a few years later, uh, an organization was formed, and it was called the Commission on Presidential Debates. And since that time, since... Uh, uh, they, they have been formed. They dictate all the rules. And guess who's chairman? Who, who, who they are? It's the former chairman, a former chairman of the Republican Party and a former chairman of the Democrat Party. And they, dic they dictate all the rules. So therefore, anybody who opposes the status quo aren't permitted to be in the debates. And that's where we are today. And this has to change, especially if you ever come around to the, please don't, please don't, if you ever get to the point where you believe the two parties are essentially the same, uh, then if the majority is outside the establishment, that it, it's not very democratic. The, the process isn't working. And uh, when you think about what we do around the world on the pretense of spreading democracy and how many people die, I think this is a tragedy. It's a tragedy that we who want to improve this country, defend our principles, defend the Constitution, and have a decent process are, are treated this way. And this is, in a way, an attempt on my part. I'm not a candidate. I'm still very interested in what's happening. And I just I'm today making a very strong suggestion of, uh, of, what, of what we can, uh, can do. You know, um, quite a few years ago, uh, when I think it was when uh, Bill Clinton was inaugurated, it was in one of his speeches, he, he recognized one uh, single individual as being very important to him philosophically. And that was a bit of a surprise because uh, I, I knew about the individual. And uh, some of you may know about him, but it's worth looking into. And his name was Carol Quigley. He wrote the book, Tragedy and Hope. Now, the important part of Tragedy and Hope and Car Carol Quigley is that he claims that he was on the inside and part of the group that, you know, did the planning. But why did he write Tragedy and Hope to expose these people behind the scenes? 
uh, because he, he believed they were far enough advanced. It didn't have to be secret. They could be out in the open. And uh, this is the way it works. It's a tragedy if you don't accept this. And there's hope if you know who runs the show. That's, a, that's my interpretation, but I believe it's correct. But let me read a quote from him. And uh, thinking about where he's coming from, he says, the argument that the two parties should represent opposed ideals and policies, uh, one, perhaps the right of the right and the other of the left, is a foolish idea acceptable only to the doctrinaire and academic thinkers. Instead, the two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shift in policy. I mean, I think that is profound statement because it tells us what's going on and uh, why things don't change. So we uh, here today are, are trying to say that uh, we represent the majority. Uh, we deserve to be heard. They deserve to be in the debates. And you say, well, how can they be? They're minor candidates. They, they don't have enough support if uh, you'd have everybody get in the debate. Well, you know, there's a simple way for cutoff. Because it's true, if you had 200 people who filed for the presidency, you, you can't expect uh, the individuals to be uh, on, the, on, the, on the stage. But there is a good way to do it, and that is to have any candidate who has gone through the onerous process, which is so biased against this, and are still on enough states that they theoretically could get enough electoral votes to win, they ought to be in the debates. And that is what our goal is. Now, what are the odds of this happening? What are the odds that the commission on a presidential debate all of a sudden will become fair and balanced? None. Absolutely none. So what are we going to do about it? We come together. It, to me, it's fantastic that we've been able to get four candidates together on this set of principles in agreeing that it's the process that they're begging to change. And uh, th this, this, to me, uh, is remarkable and important. So what, what else can they do? Well, I think the four candidates very well could get together. Uh, that generally is something I had to do in the primary race, you know, exclusion, don't do this, marginalize. We would just go and have our own. And uh, I, I know it, it's difficult to think about, and there's probably arguments against it. I don't even know if the four would agree. I haven't even talked to them. But, uh, you know, if they could get together and bring all their supporters together, you know, and, uh, and maybe, maybe the media would pay attention and say, maybe there are some important issues. Maybe civil liberties do count. Maybe foreign policy does count. Maybe we ought to change the Federal Reserve. Maybe we shouldn't continue to bail out all the corporations of the world. You know, they're all lining up. It's the auto companies. But it's not going to work. And that's why the people are waking up. We know we're getting near the end of this. And that's why I think it's a bigger number, 60%. You'll never know about watching TV because it's a horse race. Who's the most evil? Oh, yeah, he's a little worse than this guy, so we need to do it. So I think what we need is to have a showing. And the only way we can have a showing is to prove this point. Now, first off, uh, where are these 60 percent? Well, there's a bunch of them who make an intellectual decision not to vote. And we shouldn't just say they're apathetic, because I know a lot who aren't apathetic and are pretty intelligent, and they figured it out. But I'd like them to vote. My recommendation is to vote. But if, if you add up those who intellectually don't vote, and you take all the alternatives and take, take that number of half the people who vote just for the lesser of two evils, uh, we, are, we are the majority. But the more, the merrier. And they say, oh, you know, the first challenge is, oh, you want to hurt the Republican. No, I don't want to hurt anybody. I want to help save the country. And therefore, if this works, if the American people would wake up, I mean, there would be just as many votes that would leave Obama. I mean, he's not for change. That, that to me, makes no sense. So if uh, the Republican side would realize what I'm trying to do, they say, they should be, they should be funding me. <laughs> they say, say, look, Obama, Obama isn't for change. And a lot of young people will go back and forth between Ron Paul and Obama. But the, but the truth is, is he and McCain, I mean, Obama beat McCain into sending more money and troops to Afghanistan. They all want to send troops to uh, Georgia and more money to Georgia. And every, they both want bailouts. So I think I've hopefully made my point. <laughs> and uh, 
I am now going to say that I am very pleased. I thank the candidates for showing. We'll have to wait and see uh, when Bob shows up. But in the meantime, uh, I want to go ahead and give each candidate some time. And uh, I, I think they won't be as long-winded as I am because we do want to get to questions. But thank you very much for, att for attending.